Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is New York Times bestselling author Laurie Nataro. She has written 11 humorous essay collections, including the Idiot Girls Action Adventure Club. Nataro was finalist for the 2012 Thurber Award for American Humor. She is also the author of three novels. Her third novel, Crossing the Horizon, was published in October 2016. In addition to her writing career, Nataro is currently a communications specialist at the University of Oregon. Thank you, Laurie, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me here. So be before you became a best-selling author, you were a journalist for a decade in Arizona. I was, yeah. So tell us about your journey from journalism to <laughs> being a novelist and humorist. Um, my journey actually was a pretty, it was a, it was a rather, it was more of a crooked path, I would say. <laughs> um, but when I was at Arizona State University, I was the editor of the, the school magazine magazine there that came out once a week. We lost our humor columnist. So I jumped in in a pinch and I just kept kind of doing the job. So in the ultimate act of nepotism, I gave myself my own job. <laughs> um, I never really wanted to go down that path of humor. I wanted to be a journalist, an investigative reporter, hmm. but I just kind of became known for writing humor pieces. And from there, I ended up at the Arizona Republic as a columnist, a daily columnist there for their website, which was in its infancy stages in like 2001. And that was humor that you were writing for them? It was, yeah, it was humor, but it was also political commentary, daily events, just mm -hmm. kind of what was in the ether. It was a very early version of that dirty word that I am going to say, it's called blogging. Mm. Um, it, it wasn't known as that then. <laughs> but, um, and then I did a weekly column for the Republic. And so it took me seven years. I started trying to publish the Idiot Girls Action Adventure Club, and no one has said it quite as eloquently oh, as you just did. Of um, <laughs> <laughs> I love the way that you said it. Um, you didn't even crack a smile, so that is awesome. Um, and so it took me seven years to get that book published, and then once I did, I was um, escorted out of the Republic, and I embarked on my career as an author, and I've been there ever since escorted out of the Republic? Yeah, well, I, I did leave on my own. It took me weeks to move out of my, I oh, had I many see. dolls there and things like that. <laughs> okay. Personal effects. So what led you to write your most recent novel, Crossing the Horizon? Well, I've been doing humor for so long and when I, and I had done maybe 10 or 11 collections of humor, mm. I really wanted to get back to journalism. And as a reporter, you're always looking for a really good story. So I found this story just by accident. It was on a, a BBC documentary about one of the women in um, this book. Her name is Elsie McKay. She was an heiress, daughter of an earl, and she was also an aviatrix. And so this documentary was about her and several other women who made the transatlantic crossing prior to Amelia Earhart. And unlike Earhart, these women actually piloted their own planes, and they have since vanished into history. So I didn't really believe it at first. I thought it was maybe a nugget of information that just got kind of stretched out like taffy to fill a whole 28 minutes of a BBC documentary. But I did some research and found out that she was real and the story was real. It was, it was genuine and bona fide. So I started looking for others that were in this arena too in 1927, 1928, and I came up with five of them. Mm. And so I focused, they're all in the book, but I focus on three in the so book. So you just talked about uh, Elsie McKay, so who are the other two that you focus on? Um, the other two were Ruth Elder, who was 23 years old, very vibrant, um, very beautiful, very young, maybe a little naive, I'm not sure, certainly very courageous. And she was just from the wrong side of the tracks and she saw this as a way to better her life. She paid for her flying lessons by entering beauty pageants and winning. And that was how she subsidized her flights. And once Lindbergh landed, she won a beauty contest that same day, and they asked her, the, you know, the MSC said, Ruth Elder, what are you gonna do with your winnings? And she said, in just a flurry of excitement, I'm going to be the first woman to cross the Atlantic in a plane. And the next day, it, it, the, she was in the, the newspapers, her beautiful face and the headline, and investors came calling because Lindbergh had made such a tremendous amount of money. Mm -hmm. There were fortunes to be made and had in aviation at that time. And they wanted a piece of the pie, and she was the perfect piece of pie to fill that role. And then Mabel Ball, was a, she was a little bit older. She's about 35. She was a very wealthy widow 
who was known as being the Queen of Diamonds. She would often wear a million dollars worth of jewelry on her body at one time. And she wanted something, she really chased fame. And once she had conquered the New York social scene and the Paris social scene, she thought, what else could I do? And she thought, hmm, when Lindbergh landed in Les Bourget, I thought I would be the first one to fly across the ocean. So she embarked on that journey as well. So all three of them are my main three women. Now, McKay and Elder are actually pilots, actually and Ball pilots. is a passenger, right? Ball is just a passenger, yes. She, um, I don't even think she would take, she would take <laughs> care of the logbook as Amelia Earhart did. I think she would probably find a feather bed and sleep in the back. Mm -hmm. she was a, she's a very complicated character, but she's also, I think, my fa favorite. Oh, uh, she's your favorite, okay. Yeah. So, um, would you mind reading a bit from the, sure. from the book? Sure, So, yeah. tell us this so what I'm setting up here is um, Elsie McKay had been interested in aviation since her stint in World War I when she was a voluntary aid detachment volunteer. Um, and she was stationed at North Holt, which was the first aerodrome base for the RAF before it was the RAF. Mm -hmm. And she was tasked with driving generals around from hangar to hangar. And she saw this magnificent invention, which was flight and saw it up close and wanted really to get her hands on it. And when she left, she did buy herself a plane. So she was the first woman in Britain to get her air, li her air pilot's license. And she was also um, nominated to the Ministry of Aviation. For a woman in 1923, that was a feat that was unparalleled. So this is, what we're setting up here is when she's taking um, flight lessons from Captain Hearn, who was a, a World War I um, hero. And she is there trying to do a very complicated maneuver in the air. So this is Elsie McKay. Hang on, she told herself as she tightened her grip as much as she could, the wind screaming wildly in her ears. Her eyes were closed. She knew that she should not open them. She was a thousand feet in the air, but right now all she had to do was hang on. That's all, she said to herself again, this time her lips moving, her eyes squeezing tighter, just hang on. Twelve minutes before, the Honorable Elsie McKay had sped up to the airfield, parked her silver Rolls Royce near the hangar, the dirt cloud of her arrival still lingering in the air. She opened up the side door to let Shim, her affectionate tan and white borzoi, out to run the field. Suited up and goggled for a run with Captain Hearn, her flying instructor, she was anxious to get back up into the air. The splendor and alchemy was consuming, swallowing her whole every time she lifted off the ground, dashing through clouds and soaring far above the rest of those anchored below. She had been entranced at the controls of the airplane, feeling charged and elated, something she had almost forgotten. It had been weeks since, she, since she'd been up. Captain Hearn, unflappable, rugged, and a veteran of the early days of aviation, emerged from the hangar with a smile and his leather flying helmet already on. The chin buckle swaying slightly as he walked toward her. He pointed upwards. She's ready if you're ready, he laughed, as if Elsie would have another answer. She called Shim back, gave him a quick pet and a kiss, and followed Hearn to the field where his biplane stood, ready for a jaunt down the runway, which is a short, clear path through a field of grass dotted with wildflowers. With the soles of her black leather spool-heeled Oxfords on the wing, Elsie pulled herself up using the lift wires that crossed between the two wings and settled into the rear cockpit. They flew into the air within seconds, and Elsie breathed it in deeply and solidly. She smiled. She had an idea. Say, Herney, she shouted to him through the cockpit telephone when they had climbed to a distinguished altitude. Loop her around the other way. The veteran flyer knew that was a maneuver that meant bringing the plane to a loop within the wheels toward the inside, putting a terrific strain on the struts. The craft was not built to fly that way. But after a glance at his and her safety belts, Hearn shook off his caution and shoved the nose of the machine down and turned her over. Elsie laughed with delight. Nearly upside down, she already knew that she was the only woman who would loop with the wheels inside the circle. boy, Herney, she shouted with a wide smile. boy." Hearn laughed and then saw the wings fluttering under tremendous pressure like a flag in a windstorm. His smile quickly vanished. He tried to bring the plane back over. Turning over, he shouted to Elsie, but she did not hear him. The only sound was the howl as her safety belt ripped away from her shoulder and the screaming wind as it snatched her out of the plane. As she was pulled into the air, her hands clenched the bracing wires, clinging to them desperately. They were the only things keeping her from hurtling to the ground miles below. Hearn immediately turned around. He saw her twirling in the air like a stone tied at the end of a string. He lowered the nose, careful not to dive too fast. The wind pressure on her must be enormous, he thought. Good Christ, that girl is never going to make it to the ground. She's not going to make it. 
Elsie knew only that she needed to keep her grip strong and tight. She needed to hold that wire as fiercely as she could. She knew only not to let go. She was in a vacuum, the wind engulfing and beating against her at the same time. Hold. There was no other thought. Hold. Hearn brought the plane down as gently as he could, the pressure of the wind easing a bit as they approached landing. Elsie swung her right leg into the cockpit and was able to pull herself back in, still holding onto the wire. The plane rolled to a stop as Hearn reached back for her, scrambling out of his seat and helping her onto the wing. Let go, he said, her hands still clenched around the wire. Elsie, let go now. Yes, she agreed, her face red and chafed, but her eyes wide and bright. Yes, I know, but I'm not sure if I can. Hearn lifted her fingers up one by one, uncurling them, releasing the lifeline of the wire, which he saw had cut through her gloves and straight to the bone. She saw what he saw, and as he helped her through the hangar with only one of her Oxfords missing, he patted her quickly on the shoulder and said, I bet you'll never ask me to do that again. Elsie looked at him, her hands held out, palms up and smeared with blood. I'll loop her any time, she said smiling. Just get me a stronger safety belt. <laughs> Amazing. That, that's amazing. a true story. I know, that's true. Yeah, and that's true. So the vast majority of the novel is based on it is. truth. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the research that you had. Yeah. The research was, uh, the university plays a massive role in this. Um, when I decided to work on this book, it was about 2010. So the inter internet was very well established. And yet I had a very difficult time trying to find out really anything about these three women, Mabel Bull in particular, hmm. um, and Elsie McKay also. So I had done some preliminary stuff. I had subscribed to the London Times, their archive, the New York Times archives, thinking that I would get an abundance of information from about these women. and I. I generated maybe two or three stories. Hmm. So my husband, who is a professor here, was going to go to the library and do some stuff on, on a project he was working on. And he said, just come and see what is available. And I poo-pooed him and I said, no, I'm not going to waste three, two or three hours of my time trying to chase this ghost. But he talked me into it and I came down here um, and I was in the library. When I left, I had about a ream of paper. I had probably about two or three hundred stories about these women which told me exactly how famous and impactful they were. Um, and it made the point that they had disappeared even more profound to me. So I became more determined at that point to really finish this book. So why did you decide to do it as a novel, a historical novel, rather than as a biography? I, in, in researching them and getting to know their personalities, I felt that if I took the position of a biography, I really would not be able to explain their motives mm -hmm. and their personalities and the relationships they had with their families and their loved ones and their co-pilots. I felt that doing it from a historical perspective, from a novel format, I could really get into inside their heads mm -hmm. and therefore express that to the reader so we really had a more thorough understanding of what they wanted to do and who they were as people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the stories of their co-pilots are also extremely yeah, interesting they are. as well. They're fascinating. Um, so why was this an important moment in history, in particular for women and for women flyers? For, for women in particular, um, England got the right to vote, um, I think, in 1918, and we got the vote, right to vote in 1920. So this is not very long after that. The 20s just exploded with opportunity for women mm -hmm. to become uh, professors. The, the opportunity was there, but it, it grew. Um, professors, lawyers, doctors, journalists. Um, and it was wide open. Women could actually felt like they could actually accomplish anything. And so this was important because aviation was such a heavily infiltrated, male-dominated field. Mm -hmm. There really were, Bessie Coleman had been um, a pilot um, in the, like the turn of the century, and so had, um, Catherine Stinson, but they were two of them, and they, they still are not very well known today. So mm -hmm. for these women to undertake a task like flying across the ocean was enormous. And the flack that they received, especially Ruth Elder, she was the youngest, she really was the one who took the most of the hits, including one from Ru Eleanor Roosevelt, who told her that it was far better for her to stay on the ground and like basically practice her typing skills than it was for her to get in the air and try to kill herself. So that's not the Eleanor Roosevelt we know of mm -hmm. World War II. That's mm -hmm. the Eleanor Roosevelt of 1927. So it was very important at that time with their, Ruth Elder had ties to the National Women's Party. They met her at the dock. They held a banquet in her honor. And for her co-pilot, George Haldeman, 
their reference to him as a feminist is the first I can find of anyone calling a man a feminist, which I think is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And they, they almost do it. They almost oh, do yeah. it. So say a little bit about that flight. Uh, Mabel's flight is just a comedy of errors again and again, and she really provides the comic relief to this because part of the book is really heavy. Mm -hmm. um, Ruth gets up, she takes off, she's in the pilot seat, and she concocts this really great route that actually it ends up saving her life. life yeah. She is, um, not to ruin things, but she is very like a hair away from, clearly she doesn't make it, Amel Amelia Earhart makes it, but she becomes, she's a hair away from landing in, in Paris. Um, fortunately, they survive, which is great. Elsie McKay, and that story I'm not gonna ruin, but I do believe that with the evidence later on that Elsie McKay actually came much closer than Ruth Elder did. And mm -hmm. I, I myself believe that Elsie McKay was probably really the first one who, who got so, 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 so amazingly mm -hmm. close. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. And this was, this was extremely dangerous. How many people disappeared during this period attempting this? When Ruth Elder took off in October of 1927, 21 people, all men. Um, actually, no, there had been some women at that point, had died in the ocean, never to be recovered. They were gone forever. Mm -hmm. and the Atlantic provides such a challenge for aviation, especially at that time. And we have to remember that they were not flying metal airplanes. They were flying wood and canvas airplanes. And they are, the cockpits are no larger than this table. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're, they're much smaller. So even for people of our size today, we, I, I clearly wouldn't fit into that plane. And so, and, and both George and Ruth were very small people. They were touching the entire way, mm -hmm. you know, and they would tap each other on the back to keep each other awake. Um, but the danger of the Atlantic is that it brews this type of storm that is unparalleled to any other place on earth. And it is charged with electricity and, and currents and massive storms. And, they, and these planes could not fly high enough to get above them. The, in some, they could fly about ten thousand feet. So mm -hmm. if you were lucky, you could get over the you could get over the storm. But what really was the most dangerous part was the ice, mm -hmm. because when you when ice collects on the plane, it affects the lift and the drift of the wings, mm -hmm. and that will bring you down into the ocean. And even Lindbergh had ice on his wings, and he was flying at some points just several feet above the ocean. Mm -hmm. So everyone knew it was very, very dangerous. So it was the ice that was the most critical point. So why do you think these women have been forgotten? That is such a good question. I've been trying to figure it out for the last seven years now, why they have been forgotten, because they really were the rock stars of their day. Mm -hmm. During my research, I realized that they were on the front pages of the London Times and the New York Times every single day. One of them was on, on the cover with pictures and, and the whole the whole bit. I have a, a copy of the Johnstown, Pennsylvania paper, and Ruth Elder is on the cover of that. Oh, there's you know? wonderful photographs all through the so, book of them. Yeah, so they, they really were very well known in their day. And I think it's part that they were women and they really weren't celebrated for their accomplishments because everyone saw them being as foolish mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and not brave, just trying to ch challenge what a man could do and what they really couldn't actually accomplish. But 21 men didn't do that either. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think it's part of winner takes all. Mm -hmm. You know, even though Amelia Earhart had not flown her plane, she did not give as much to aviation as these women did. She was still the symbol. She was handpicked by George Putnam and Amy Guest precisely because she was a pilot. She was not a very good pilot. She crashed every plane she ever flew. Hmm. Um, but she looked remarkably like Charles Lindbergh, and she had a stellar social background. Mm -hmm. So she was handpicked for that flight, and naturally she went on to marry George Putnam. And um, Elder was a working class girl from. She was. She was. They were poor. From Alabama. Aniston, Alabama. Yeah. Yeah, which is not even close to being of Birmingham status. Her father was the post office manager, and they lived on the wrong side of the tracks. Twelve kids, like four to a bed. It was they. You, they their kids got married and got out of the house, and that was the way that it was. And she wanted to take a different route, and she did make enough money that she ended up putting several of her siblings through college. Yeah, she. I mean, subsequently, she becomes a Hollywood starlet. She right? does. Yeah, until the talkies take over. Yeah. She was a silent film actress, um, and by that time, she had married three four times. She was married to Walter Camp, who was the manager of uh, Madison Square Garden. Oh, yeah, Sorry. right. Madison so Square I, Garden. Yeah, yeah right. so I think she, she retired after that. So um, 
so there's this period in the 20s where the, the, all these women are trying to do mm -hmm. this thing, right? And and then it sort of stops. It stops because of the Wall Street crash. Uh -huh. Everything came to an end financially. Everything was off, and that that the window closed for women because everyone had to concentrate on just basically surviving, and that meant that whatever frivolous dreams you had of getting an education or or furthering yourself in life was going to be put on hold. And that window doesn't really open up again until about 1965 when Betty Friedan <laughs> writes *The Feminine Mystique*. I mean, true, there were women who were working in factories and in, in mm -hmm. you know in the World War in World War II, but when the men came home, they were told, "Now you go home and start having kids," mm -hmm. and that is what they did. So you, you, I've heard in another interview you did, you gave a statistic about the amount of women that were in aviation yeah. in the 20s. Tell us what that figure is. In the 20s, it was 6%. Okay, and now it's the 21st century. What is it's it? It's still 6%. What do you make of that? <laughs> I have talked to in on I went on a 17 city country wide tour and I talked to many 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 female pilots and those who are in the navy those who have their certifications to fly jets I hear it again and again is a very challenging field for women mm -hmm. it is just really not that open to them um, they if they continue in aviation where they usually find a place is in the private charter mm -hmm. industry. Right, right. Um, but typically they're not going to be flying commercial jets. And when I was, I was actually in Alabama flying in from, for my date there at the Southern Flying Museum, and I was actually on the shuttle with the pilot who had been flying my plane. Hmm. So he was there with his co-pilot and then there were several flight attendants. And so I just turned around and I said to him, you know, I've been writing this book, and since 2010, I've been looking on every single plane that I get to find a, a female pilot, and I haven't seen one. Why, why is that? How many female pilots are in your, it's a rather big aviation company, um, mm -hmm. airline. <laughs> um, and he said, well, I, I don't know why there's, he said, well, there's, there's, a, there's quite a few. And I said, well, how many is quite a few? And then he kind of backed down and said, well, you know, I don't know why really there aren't any more because they can write their own ticket. And I said, well, what, what does that exactly mean? He said, well, we have breastfeeding rooms now. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, well, there you go. There you well, go. why wouldn't they want to be pilots, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, and then I looked over at the stewardesses and the, the flight attendants, and they were shaking their heads. They were just like, <laughs> 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 not So what kind of challenges did you encounter? You gave us a sense about sort of initially the research issues, but did you have any challenges writing the book? Challenges were... I, I had this abundance of information. I had so much. Mm -hmm. And every day my jaw would drop when I would go back and do more research and it find is these draw things. It, it just, and this stuff is true. Mm -hmm. And you just, you cannot make it up. You can't make their stories up because no one would believe you. Um, so the challenge for me, I think, was trying to put this in a cohesive sense where you have three women who never met, but who had contacts with each other all over the place. Mm -hmm. Everything was very, very, very tied together. The aviation community was very small. And in, in these newspaper stories, they're always talking about each they other are. as being yes. competitors for right. this goal. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, they are. Um, they were very neck and neck. Um, and most of them were not, most of them were very cordial. Mm -hmm. Most of them were very hospitable, very generous. There were some that weren't as nice, that were a little bit more uh, cut tooth. But for the most part, Trying to get those stories and trying to figure out the structure of the book was, was difficult. And then it just came to me one day and I thought, oh, yes, of course. That's how I do it. I set up my backstory and then I'm going to incorporate all three of them at the same timelines mm -hmm. where they need to be in, in that point. Because they fly during almost, it's almost a year apart before one takes off and the other takes off. And you interweave these stories throughout the novel. Right. And I was able to do that with their connections with each other. Yeah. So I'm... Um, how does your, uh, your approach different when you're writing fiction and writing memoir? The structure is is almost the same. I mean, you have a beginning. You've got you know three acts, um, and honestly, teaching. I teach some humor classes when I go back to Arizona. At, at mm -hmm. Sometimes at ASU, but at bookstores around. And I develop this kind of take where I have the students write an A, B, and C ending: beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. They have an ending for that, and then they also have a beginning. You, they have your their leads is A, B, and C. And that actually was something that helped me write this book because mm. it was a, I was able to take it from different p time points, mm -hmm. and and not always start off chronologically at the beginning. I could back up a little bit and play with my parts mm -hmm. a little bit. So mm -hmm. that was interesting. Um, but 
yeah, that's how the structure kind of came about. Is so you've written 11 humor, 11, 12 books yeah. of humor, and then you've written three novels. This is the third. Right. So there's two others. Uh, there's a slight chance I might be going to hell, 2007, mm -hmm. and Spooky Little Girl in 2010. Right. Tell us a little bit about those two novels. They're um, quite different. Than they are this very one. different. Um, there's a slight chance I might be going to hell. It was based on my experience moving from Phoenix to Eugene, um, and not being able to make friends. So I did. I joined every single club that I, I knew of. I would try to make friends in the grocery store until people thought that I was stalking them. It was, I had lived in Phoenix for, <laughs> you know, for 40 years and having a, a really secure, stable bunch of friends to having no one was quite a shock to me. And the cultural shock was different as well. Eugene is his own encapsulated cultural environment, and Phoenix is very different from that. So there are lots of things to play off in that. In Spooky Little Girl, that was also based on a true story of my dental hygienist best friend who died, and no one knew that she was dead for a year because it was basically, it was a little bit before the internet, and there was just, it was amazing to me how someone could die and literally vanish off the face of the earth without their loved ones knowing, and it truly happened. So I wrote that story about, um, about that storyline, um, and both of these are very humorous books. I and, hope. and and also they're sort of gender bending book. I mean, genre. Bending oh, it's books. complete women's fiction. Absolutely, women's fiction? absolutely, yeah. Because like one is a kind of YA ghost story, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's she's a little bit older, but it ha it's very playful, and I want it to be very rollicking and not serious at all. Um, even though we're dealing with death, you know, it was just basically my imagination gone wild. So we've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, what are you working on now, writing-wise? I'm working on another book of historical fiction very similar to Crossing <laughs> um, in that I'm using a historical event and not really fictionalizing it, but writing it in a novel format. And it's about a murder <laughs> that was taken place around the corner from my home in when I lived in Phoenix in 1931 about a woman who shot her two best friends and then shot them up and put them in a trunk and shipped them off to LA. Uh, and then she spends the rest of her life in an insane asylum, but she escapes six times. She, she be, she's a very huge Arizona legend. Hmm. And um, my research on her is done. I've been researching her for four years. And the outcome that I have discovered is quite different than the outcome that is her traditional story. Well, we look forward to that story when it comes out, and uh, I hope people will read Crossing the Horizon. It's a fascinating, fascinating tale, and I have a secret dream that's going to be a, a made-for-TV <laughs> series someday. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you Lori Nataro, for speaking with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. I've been speaking with New York Times best-selling author Lori Nataro. She has written 11 humorous essay collections, including the Idiot Girls Action Adventure Club. Her novel, Crossing the Horizon, was published in October 2016. Thanks so much for watching.